if you have your Bibles, uh, I want you to, uh, no, I don't want you to do that yet. I want to give you a note card. I hope you got a pen or a pencil. And I want you to write down this thought real quick. Uh, I want to ask you, and, and uh, you know, people are bad in church about giving real super spiritual answers. <laughs> uh, ask the kids questions like, uh, you know, if you could have one thing uh, in the world, if you could have anything, you know, what would you want? Uh, I just want more of God's wisdom. You know, and you're like, dude, y'all, come on. Uh, give me the real answer that you really think. Uh, I had taught all week at a youth camp a couple years ago about the Bible. I asked kids the last night of the youth camp, I remember I said, if your house was on fire, you could go back inside for one thing, what would you go back in for? And they said, I'd go back in for my Bible. <laughs> And I look, some of them didn't even have their Bible with them. <laughs> I thought, oh yeah, you'd rush into a burning house to save your Bible, but you didn't even carry it with you to youth camp. Good answer, <laughs> good answer. So what I want you to do real quick is I want you to pin down just real quick. Um, think if there was a, what does it take to make you happy? I want to know what, uh, what it would take to make you happy. Or if you feel like you already have it, what, what is it that makes you happy, that gives you that, that happy feeling, that sense of fulfillment what is that what does that look like maybe just in a few words or a couple sentences if you'll pencil that down this is really just for you i don't even necessarily have to have them i want you to just pencil it down now some people they think in their head see so this is okay let me tell you what i'm looking for some people think in their head if i had this one thing to happen then I feel like I would be completely satisfied. My life would be complete. I would have that, uh, that sense of fulfillment. I would feel like I had everything I needed, everything I desired, if this. Maybe we have those, those thoughts. Maybe you feel like you already have attained it. Because I have this, I feel a sense of happiness. I feel uh, complete in that area. I feel uh, a sense of purpose and fulfillment. Just pencil that down real quick, if you don't mind thinking on those lines. So what is it that uh, gives you happiness, that brings you completeness, joy, fulfillment? Or if it's something that you feel like you don't have, what would it be? What, what would it be that if this happened or if I had this, I would feel completely satisfied? I would have all my joy, all my happiness if I had this right here. What would that look like? What would that be for you? All right, got it penciled down. All right, then set that to the side if you don't mind and open your Bible to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's one of the first books I ever taught from. That's what I know. What? She's struggling with Good. Love phrases are so weird. And I, I got this sign. I was sitting on the couch last, <laughs> not last night, the night before, and I said, Blake, just let me read this verse to you. Okay, I got and you. I read it, and I said, what does that mean? And I read in my notes, I read commentary, and, like, and he told me what he thought it meant. And I was like, oh, okay. I but got it's you. Just, his wording. Of His word. I agree. I, I understand. All right. So, and it's interesting because somebody else was reading this week in the book of Ecclesiastes and they said, Who even wrote this? What is it? Well, I got to be careful. That sounds kind of like her. Um, <laughs> no, no. It was Dina who was reading in the book of Ecclesiastes and was wondering, What is this? What does it all mean? And I love the book of Ecclesiastes and I can't remember if it was um, WMU or something like that. I mean, years ago when I was like a kid, I was 14 or 15 years old. This is one of the first things. I taught about uh, was out of the book of Ecclesiastes and I taught the whole book so that was an interesting one but it is quick it has one uh, central theme to it uh, but let me give you a little bit of background information uh, King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and if you're reading chronologically I like the way that it's organized that as such is that Solomon was so wise and he was doing such a good job as the king God had his hand on him I mean he really did uh, and then towards the end of his life it's like he kind of went crazy all of a sudden and he started doing all this crazy stuff and God removed his hand from his ministry he took the kingdom away from him and here at the end of his life is when he broke the book of Ecclesiastes and I like how it's all in order like he was so wise and he never lost his wisdom but then right there toward the end he started doing all these crazy things and when you come to the book of Ecclesiastes Solomon writes and he says I'm at basically at the end of my life and there's a few things that I've learned that I want to pin down that I want to be able to pass on to other people and one of the key words that shows up in in the book of Ecclesiastes and as you're reading it you could underline it is the word vanity now 
When we hear the word vanity, typically what do we think of when we hear vanity? Conceited. Conceited. You're full of yourself. Okay, they wrote the song, You're So Vain. What's the rest? Probably think this song. You, I bet you think this song is about you. So when we hear the word vain, typically we're thinking, oh, an egotistical, conceited person. But that's not what the word vain means in this context. So I would probably jot this down on the page that says Ecclesiastes. Vanity means empty or meaningless. So when he says, that was vanity, this is vain, this is vain, this is vain, this is vanity. He said, that's empty, that's empty, that's empty, that's empty, and that's empty. So what he does here is basically, it's almost like he's doing an experiment. He said, I come to the end of my life and I want to know if there is anything that could give me a fulfilled feeling that could satisfy me, I want to know how to find it. And you, I can already kind of give you a hint in this book of Ecclesiastes which is very short just 12 chapters he uses the word vanity and vain probably a hundred times so what he basically does is he does all this uh, experimenting uh, let me try this well let me try this well that didn't work let me try this and he said that's empty that's empty that's empty that's empty so let's jump right into what Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Look at verse number 1. Obviously it says, These are the words of the preacher, the son of David, who was the king in Jerusalem. That's what lets us know that this was Solomon. He says in verse number 2, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And we can literally substitute the word vanity with empty. So if you read that again, he says in verse number 2, Empty of empties, says the preacher. Empty of empty. All is empty. Now I don't know about you, but the more that I spend time in this world, and I spend my, my money, I spend my effort and I put my uh, work towards getting different things and doing different things. Are you finding that 99.9% .9 of things just leave you feeling empty? I mean, have y'all found that as well? He said, most things are going to leave you empty. Now let's look at verse number 3. He said, what profit has a man of all his labor which he takes under the sun? Now there's your second key phrase. He uses that word vanity or empty a hundred times in this text. And then he also keeps using this phrase, under the sun. Now what do you think under the sun means? It means on earth. Anything that's under the sun is stuff that's down here. So if I look at that, that's under the sun. You're under the sun. I'm under the sun. My house, my car, my family. All of those things are under the sun. So he asked this question in verse number 3. He said, what profit does a man have of everything that he works for of those things that are under the sun? And then look at what he says in verse number 4. He said, one generation passes away, another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Now, I want us to hop right into where he does this. I don't, and I don't mean to belittle it, but it's almost like an experiment. He says, I'm just going to do this like social experiment here. I got money. I got endless resources. He said, I'm the king. He said, I got all all the dough that we need to spend on this let me just hop right to it and let me just spend all the money and let me just try all these different things and let's see what it comes to look at verse number 12 here's his story he says in verse number 12 I the preacher I was king over Israel in Jerusalem and I gave my heart to seek and search by wisdom concerning all things that are done under the sun he said I, I sought it out all things that you find under the sun and he said in verse number 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. Now the word vexation means when your spirit is angry or it's at rest. It's, it's dissatisfied. It feels restless. He said, so everything that I tried, and he's about to list it off. I mean, it, it's, this is so practical. I love it. He said, everything that I tried left me feeling empty or left my soul feeling restless or almost angry because it did not give me the feeling of satisfaction that I thought that it would give me. So then he says in verse number uh, 16, I communed with my heart. I said, lo, I am come to great estate. You know what that means? I got plenty of money. He said, and having gotten more wisdom than all they that are before me in Jerusalem, my heart had great experience of, not, of, of, great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Verse number 17. He said, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and to know folly, and I perceive that this also is a vexation of the Spirit. Now let me just start with that. 
In chapter 1, you know what he says? He says, I've got a title and it precedes me. He said, I'm Solomon. And when you hear the name Solomon, you probably think, why is this man in the world? He said, I want to start out by telling you that all the wisdom in the world still leaves you feeling empty. See, isn't that what he said in verse number 16? He said, I have come to a great estate. My heart has great experience in wisdom and knowledge. Look at verse number 17. He said, I've known wisdom. And he said, I perceive that this is a vexation of the Spirit. He said, so if it wasn't my name that had, why is this man ever? If it was Kelly, why is this woman ever? Jennifer Kylie, why is this woman ever? Or Ashley Guthrie, why is this woman ever? He said, I can go ahead and tell you because I've lived it and I've experienced it. That would not give you a feeling of satisfaction. You would still feel like your soul was at rest. Uh, not at rest. It was restless. So the first chapter he talks about how wisdom won't make you feel that way. Now here's the part that I like. Look at chapter number 2. Here's what I like right here. He said, I said in my heart in verse number 1, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Now mirth is a word we don't use a lot. So I want you to write this down if you're jotting down notes. Mirth means amusement. Amusement. So in chapter 2, he said, I decided to do this little experiment and I thought, I'll just spend money on every bit of amusement that I could possibly spend money on. See, for us, if this was in 2018, we would say, I'll go to every amusement park. I'll visit everything that Disney World and American Universal Studios, I'll go to every one of those parks they've ever put together. I'll go to the Grand Canyon. I'll go to every play, every Broadway, every musical. I'll go to everything like that. He said, I'll just, I'll just have my heart's fill in mirth, in amusement. Look at what he said in verse number 1. Therefore, he said to himself, enjoy pleasure. He said, this was vanity. I went to every amusing thing I could find. Universal, Disney, Epcot Center, Disney World, Disneyland. I went to all of them, he said, and it still left me feeling empty. Verse number three, he said, So then I sought in my heart to give myself to wine. You see, for Solomon, he had these thoughts about him. Well, I bet if I could spend all my money on amusement, I'd have to feel fulfilled then, right? And he said, no, I didn't. And then he said, well, if I spent all the money that I had and I spent every dime I wanted to seeking after wine and I had the best stuff, I had the really aged stuff that was very costly and expensive, maybe that will give me that feeling. And look at what he says in verse number four. He continues. I like this. Listen to this. He said, I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I had pools of water. I had uh, to water the, the wood that brings forth the trees. He said, I got servants. I got maidens. I had servants born in my house. I had great possessions of cattle that were before me in Jerusalem. He said, I gathered silver and gold and then peculiar treasures. Now listen, be honest. You don't have to be honest vocally out loud with me, but be honest. In your heart, isn't it natural to think Man, if I had a pool, I probably would be happy. I mean, it, I mean, just be honest. We do that. We do that. If I had a pool, I'd be happy. If I had a bigger house, I'd be happy. If I didn't have to clean my house and I had maids and servants that lived in my house and did it for me, I know I would be happy then. And then, so he says, well, if I had fruit trees where I didn't have to go buy it, if I just had that growing out there in the yard, oh my gosh, how happy I would be. And then he got down here into verse number 8. He said, and I got silver and gold. And then look at the next little phrase there. He said, I got peculiar treasures of kings of the provinces. He said, then I went after those novelty items that, that were the rare finds. That, like he probably got a, a piece of gold from out of the mines from some other country. Like I want these weird things coming in. For us, that would be I want the new I want the new smartwatch I want the phone that does this I want the clap on lights you know y'all are so lame this morning like, but yeah I want the clap on lights I remember being a kid and, and those commercials would come on and that woman would be like she'd raise about a bit. <laughs> you know those infomercials that are so weird I mean she was like 
It was the weirdest thing. But anyway. And then he said, and so if we were translating this into our day, and be honest, don't we have these very same thoughts? If I had this, oh, you can't tell me. Oh, I know so-and-so's got a pool, but if I had the pool, and then I had the maid to clean it, and I had this, and I had that, I know I would be happier then. I know I would, right? And he says in verse number 8, listen to this. Things I never even thought of. He said in verse number 8, I got me men singers and women singers. He said, I got people just to stand around and sing to me. I think that would be pretty cool, don't you? I mean, you couldn't be in... Okay, she's got Blake doing that. All right. I thought that'd be pretty cool, you know, if they just stood around and sung to you. And then he said, look at what he said. He said they had musical instruments of all sorts. Look at verse number 9. I was great. I was increased more than all them that were before me in Jerusalem. And he makes this little tack on. Also, my wisdom remain with me. But look at what he says in verse number 10. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. My heart rejoiced in all my labor. This was the portion of my labor. In verse number 11, you say, I had it feel solemn. Tell me how it felt to have the pools, to have the maid servants, the gold, the silver, the peculiar things. How does that life feel. I just know it would be so fulfilling. It would bring you that happiness. He says in verse number 11, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, on the labor that I had labored to do, and all of it was vanity. It was empty. It was a vexation of my spirit. My, st my spirit still felt uneasy, restless, like there's got to be something more. Now, Welcome to America. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Don't we constantly think that if I only had this, and then I only had that, and I only had that, but once you get those things, isn't there a constant feeling inside your heart that there's still got to be something more? I mean, are y'all relating to me? Or am I the only one who sees this? Absolutely. This is where we are, where we constantly feel like there's more. He said, I had it all. He said in verse number 11, but it was empty. It left my, my spirit feeling restless. And verse number 11, he said, And there was no prophet under the sun. Can I tell you this? That King Solomon wrote this 977 years before Christ was ever born. And here we are at 2,000 years after Christ. So almost 3,000 years ago, this man did the experiment. I would have run out quickly. I mean, you know, I, can't, I couldn't even buy one car to start the experiment because I don't have the money. But he had all the money and he said, let me just go ahead and do it. And let me go ahead and just try it. Let me just buy it all and do everything. And he did and he pinned it down. And it's right here in the book. It's in God's holy word. And this is what he said. I bought it all. I tried absolutely everything and at the end of the day it was empty and my soul still had that nagging feeling that there's got to be something else. Have you realized that yet? Have you realized it yet? Or are you still blowing your money? I'm not trying to be personal, but are you still racking up credit card debt that if you started paying right now, you couldn't pay off before you died? Are you still just racking up debt? Are you still having that, that, that I got to go after it? There's got to be something more. If I just get this, then I'm going to feel it. Mm, my heart's going to feel satisfied. Or have you realized that 3,000 years ago, a man tried it all. He did absolutely everything. And he put it in front of us in black and white. Have everything under the sun, he said. And your heart will still feel empty. And your spirit will still feel like there's something else out there that you need to seek after. This is a truth about humanity. It's a truth about life that it never comes from anything, and here's his phrase, that is under the sun. But here's the thing. The quicker we learn this, the better off we'll be. The quicker we learn this truth, the better off we'll be. The less money we'll be wasting and, and the less debt we'll be racking up trying to get that one more thing, that one more experience that we think is just going to give us that satisfied, man, now I've got it all feeling. I mean, why do we ignore His wisdom here? He said, I did it. I got everything. And it left me feeling empty. Now let's look at some more things He says. 
I love reading after the wisest man who ever lived because, man, he's got some wisdom, doesn't he? I mean, he really does. Now, us grabbing a hold of it, that becomes a process. That's a prayer where we ask God. That's a prayer where we remind God, we say, Solomon said that if I had everything in this whole world, my heart would still desire one more thing. God, you help me then. You help me not to desire those things. Help me to grasp that truth and live like I know it. Help me, listen to this, here's where the rubber meets the road. Help me teach my children. Do you hear me? Because some of us think we've grasped it for ourselves, but then we overindulge our children by buying them every single thing they want. I heard a, a five-year-old or six-year-old, seven-year-old, I don't know how old she was the other day, said, Oh my gosh, I left my cell phone. It was out in the parking lot the other day. Sorry if that was one of y'all's kids, but I was like, I, I couldn't help it. I, I said, you got a cell phone? <laughs> I mean, it was, she didn't even, she didn't, I mean, the little kid, you know, I heard a mousy little voice. Oh my gosh, my cell phone's in the, is in the, I left it somewhere. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, that kid ought to be looking for a toy of some sort. I mean, she done lost her probably iPhone 9, something nicer than I got, so laying somewhere. But listen, we think we've got this, uh, maybe we think we've got this tree truth known and mastered but then we're teaching our children well let's let's go buy this okay well you want that okay you think that's gonna make you happy oh if Sandy Claus buys you that and that and that and that and that 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 and that why well, he doesn't have claws at all <laughs> <laughs> and we're teaching our children why don't we start by telling our children and I know I don't have children, so I'm just, you know, talking on a room I have no room to speak on. But still, why don't we tell our children, look, just be happy with what you have. You get that new Barbie Dream Mansion, guess what? There's going to have a, a, a second edition come out. You're going to want that. You're going to want more. You're gonna, it, it's ne that feeling will never go away. Why don't we teach our children, hey, that, that in your heart that says if you just had that that your friend has, hey, I'm 45 years old, baby, and it doesn't ever go away. Learn to just quiet that feeling right now and say, I mean, I'm not 45. Ashley Guthrie looked at me like, what, when did you turn 45? I was just kidding. But why don't we go ahead and say, hey, that's a feeling. It's like a pit and nothing under the sun will ever feel it. So maybe we've grasped it. Maybe we haven't. Are we teaching that to our children? Now look at what he says in chapter number 2, verse number 16. There's a lot I'd like to cover this morning. I hope we can get to it. Let's look at verse number 16. He's just got such good stuff to say, so practical. He says in verse number 16, he said, There's no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that that which is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. He said, How dies the wise man? Just like the fool. You ever realize that? My dad used to say every grave is the same size. <laughs> Made out of the same stuff. And everybody ends up in one of those. You know? He said the wise man is going to die just like the foolish man. Look at what he says in verse number 17. He says, therefore, after he did all this, he said, I hated life because the work that is wrought, notice that he says where? Under the sun. Now we're going to get into a different category of things beyond the sun. He said, but the things that are all under the sun is grievous to me. Why? Because it's all vanity, empty. It's all vexation of the Spirit, a restlessness of your spirit, always seeking more. Verse number 18, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it to the man that shall be after me. You ever thought about that? <laughs> your nice prize car and your fancy clean swimming pool and your nice house, you know somebody else is going to be driving that thing around. Somebody else is going to be uh, using your things when you're gone. Isn't that kind of a sickening feeling? <laughs> But isn't it the truth? I mean, you're not going to take it with you, right? So pour into your, your, your retirement home down there in Florida and just make sure that it's swept so clean that there's not a grain of sand. There's going to be some rough party of kids come tracking through there and they're going to track mud all through your dream home when you're dead and gone and there's nothing you can do about it. And Solomon said, when I had this realization in verse number 18, because I should leave it to the man that'll be after me. He said, it almost made me sick that I'm racking up all these things. Have you thought about that? All the things that we spend our money on, all our little signs, wreaths, and trinkets, somebody's going to be rearranging them, 
probably selling them at their garage sale or your estate sale for 50 cents when you probably paid $55 for them. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we're being drab this morning, let's just be drab. It's all going to go away. Look at what he says in verse number 19. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored. He said, I don't even know if a wise man's going to get my stuff or not. It could be some foolish kid who's going to blow the engine on my car. I mean, he said, we don't know who's going to get it. But he said, I just know that everything that I've showed myself wise under the sun is all just empty. Now I know it sounds very repetitive, but let me tell you something. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is repetitive. You say, we got it, Jennifer. Do we really have it, though? If we really have it, I don't think that our bank accounts would look like they do. If we really had it, our homes would not look like they do. And if we really had it, our hearts would not feel empty and always seeking more and feeling restless like I could just about bet that yours does because mine still does. Do you know what I'm saying? So sometimes repetitive is good for us. Now look at chapter, and this will, this will encourage you because we're kind of moving on. All right, let's flip over to chapter 4. I mean, he continues to say these same things over and over again. There's a time to do this and there's a time to do that, but I tried to pick the highlights. Look at chapter 4. Now he's already come to this conclusion that nothing under the sun. So let me go ahead and say this to you. If you wrote down on that card that your happiness has something to do with your family, that's a noble statement, sure. But it's not right because guess what? You know where your family is? They're under the sun. And they'll never give you that feeling. If you said, oh, my happiness was when I had my children. And oh, when I, my family was complete, you know, and there was all four and no more. And that's when I really felt that feeling of happiness and uh, satisfaction. Well, guess what? That kind of fades when they start acting like a fool. <laughs> you start thinking, why did I even have you? I mean, you know, I mean, I would think that. Maybe that's why I don't have kids, but you know what I'm saying? And so if you wrote on there that it had to do something with your job, guess what? That's under the sun too. If you said that it was about uh, anything that's under the sun, he's already come to that conclusion. Now look at what he begins to do in chapter number four. He said, now, while I would tell you from my experience that nothing under the sun. I said nothing. So I can even go so far as to say this. If you are not happy right here, right now, in this moment, in this room, then you're not going to have happiness. You say, but my children aren't here, Jennifer. It doesn't take your children. You say, but my spouse, my soulmate, he's not in here with me right now. So no, I can't say I have complete happiness. Then you're not going to be happy. Because it's not found in any of those things under the sun. So Solomon says, I've already told you that nothing's going to give you that feeling. But look at what he does in chapter number 4. He said, but I'll tell you some things that I found out are better than others. Look at verse number 6. He said, better. Now he's not talking it'll leave you satisfied. It'll give you all that feeling you've ever wanted. But he said, I can tell you some things that are better than others under the sun. He said in verse number 6, better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail, which is painful labor and effort, and vexation, a restless spirit. Now have you come to that understanding yet? It'd be better to have just a little bit, but there'd be peace, than to have both of your hands heaping full, but your spirit feel restless, and it says to be full of travail where you have had to work so hard and put so much effort into having it. I don't know why, but the first thing that comes to my mind is maybe like with an inheritance or something. You know, the older you get and the wiser you are, you know what you begin to realize? Man, I'd rather have two dimes and peace with my family. I mean, you know what I'm saying? than to have just a mass of things, but everybody in my family and everybody that I know hates me and can't even look me in the eyes over it. I mean, have we come to realize that yet? Better, he said, is just a handful of peace. Man, I feel that way. This, it's better to have just a handful of peace and quiet than both hands full with painful, laborious effort, an angry spirit or a restless spirit. Then he says, look at verse number 7, Then I returned and I saw vanity. Under the sun. He said, even though that's better, you still won't have that feeling of fullness. You'll still feel empty. Look at what he says in verse number 8. He said, there is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he has neither child nor brother, 
Yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither says he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good. This also is empty. Now look at what he says. You say, what is he talking about? Look at verse number 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if one fall, the other will lift him up. And woe to the one that is alone when he falleth. He said, you know what I've learned about life? It's better to do it with other people. Have you figured that out yet? You don't need a thousand friends. If you want to be honest, you probably don't even need ten. Ten friends sounds like a lot. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'll probably have five good friends. I mean, maybe that's bad. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all are looking at me like, only five? But I'll probably have five good friends, you know? And you know, those are important relationships to me. You figured that out, right? You don't want to be the person who says, I can do this all by myself. Because Solomon said, better it is to have two people doing this thing than to have just one. But you know, there's time that has to be poured into relationships. The Bible says a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Some people are too busy and too unfriendly to have friends. But Solomon said it's better to go through this thing with other people doing it with you than to try it alone. Now let's move on to chapter number 5. See, I'm just trying to hit the highlights. And maybe I'll whet your appetite that you'll want to go back and read it all and really take in what he was saying. Look at chapter number 5. Verse number 10, here's some more great wisdom about things and about trying to satisfy our souls. He says in verse number 10, He that loves silver shall never be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. Have you figured that out yet? The person who loves money and wants money is never satisfied with money. John D. Rockefeller, who was the only individual to ever build a skyscraper with his own personal money, not a company's money, not an organization's money, his own personal pocket, John D. Rockefeller built a skyscraper with his own personal money. When John D. Rockefeller was dying, somebody said to him on his deathbed, John, if you could have one more thing, here you are, a successful man, you've come to the end of your life, if you could have one more thing, what would it be? You know what he said? One more dollar. You already built a skyscraper with your own money. And we shake our heads like, that is so ridiculous. But isn't it true that when you start feeling that love for money and you start, I like when my bank account gets like that, you know, we're never satisfied anywhere that we are. And he says in verse number 11, I see if you've learned this to be true. I just think it's amazing that 3,000 years ago, he nailed it, man. He nailed how people are. He nailed how the human spirit is. Look at what he says in verse number 11. He said, when the goods are increased, they're increased to eat them. <laughs> you ever found out how friends are? Boy, they can sniff out a, a pay raise quicker. You know what I'm saying? You got any family members like that? Well, you get a raise, you get a little extra, you get a good uh, year of uh, tax returns, and man, don't they come out of the woodworks. Needing just to borrow, just a little bit here and there, right? And the Bible said that when the goods are increased, they are increased that eat them. Hey, you get a refrigerator full of groceries, guess what? You'll get a house full of people to come over and eat all of those groceries if you haven't figured that out. When the times are good, the friends come running. And he said, you know what? He said uh, in verse number 11, look at what he said. What good is there to the owners thereof, saving just the beholding of them with their eyes? You ever thought about that, about your stuff, your things? For me, for a long time, it was cowboy boots. I don't know what my obsession with those was. You know, those are not cheap. Uh, Tiffany, are they cheap? Kylie, are they cheap? No, they're not cheap. I mean, I'm talking for a good pair of boots. I mean, they're 200 and something dollars a pair. And that's the kind I like, man. And I wanted one of every different kind. Like I thought, I've never worn Ariat before. So I remember going to the boot store and I said, I want a pair of Ariats. I said, I've never had any that have the cowboy heel on them. I want a pair of those. I said, you know, I've never had any of the Twisted X boots. I, I want to wear a pair of those. I want to see how those feel. I never had the Rocky kind. I've never had this kind. And I started buying those. And goodness, I mean, I, I probably had at one time $2,000 in about, you know, six pairs, seven pairs of cowboy boots. And they were nice. They were pretty. I had the green kind. I had the orange ones. Some with the assist holes, you know. I, 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 don't, I was just weird like that. I wanted the, all the different little things that could come with them. And you know, one day I kind of realized what he said right here. He said, what good is it to the owner except just looking at them with your eyes? <laughs> I mean, isn't that where it gets? Why do I want all that crap hanging on the wall? Just to sit here and look at it? 
Why do I want that car that everybody desires? Just to sit here and just stare at it? I know this stuff's not easy to take. <laughs> but when you realize that 3,000 years ago, somebody just literally wrote the book on it all. Yeah. I mean, literally wrote the book. Named every emotion, every feeling, every different scenario. He had way more resources than we have. He spent every dime seeking every different thing. And he said, hey, it'll make you feel empty. And like there's always something else. Then he goes on to say, in verse number 12, I like this too. He said, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. He said, a man who just works to, to live his life, he, it doesn't matter if he eats just a little bit before he goes to bed or he eats a lot, he sleeps through the night. Man, he's a working man. He said, but in verse number 12, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Now, I don't know how this feels, but there are some people that can't sleep at night because they're so worried that somebody's going to get into their this or get into their that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or what if they found this? Or that safe, what if it wasn't click close all the way? Or what if they found out about this account over here and they got into that and there are some people, I'm not one of them, I can sleep fine. Like they're going to get that little 12 inch TV out of the entertainment center in there, have at it y'all. I mean it's as big as a computer monitor, snatch it right out of there. Um, y'all are so lucky. No, but um, anyway, it really is, it's tiny. But you know some people sit up at night. And if we're not those types of people, we don't understand that. But let me tell you, there are a lot of people in America who are right here in this boat. And he says, and he goes on to say in verse 13, he said, There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun. It's riches kept for the owners to their hurt. In verse number 15, this is popular. He says, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked he'll return to go as he came. He shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. I know that's a common thing and it's a truth, but have you thought about that? This stuff's not going with you. Let's look over in uh, chapter number 7. A couple more betters here. How much time we got? What time is it? 10.30. 10 oh, we got plenty of time. I bet we'll get through it all. Look at verse number 7, something he said right here. He said, that'll all make you feel empty. But he said, look at this. Verse number 1. Chapter number 7, verse number 1. A good name is better than precious ointment. Have you realized that yet? It doesn't matter how much money you have. When people hear your name, there's something that comes to their mind. I mean, you know that, right? When hear, people hear the name Jennifer Tucker, something pops in their head about me. I want that to be a good thing. And you ought to want that to be a good thing too. You know, there are people who have amassed large amounts of money, but when I hear their name, I, thought, I, I think to myself, crooked? Crooked, conniving, thief. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And Solomon says, if you want to be honest, more than you ought to be worried about how much you can get and how many things you can hoard up, be worried about what people think when your name comes up. Now, I know we hear that phrase, I just don't care what people think about me. I do. I mean, you know, I do. I don't lay awake at night thinking, oh, I hope they didn't. Now, some people, man, you take it overboard. I'm just saying. You ever been around one of those kind of people? They'll call you, hey, did I hurt your feelings the other day? When we, we were talking about something, and, and I, said that I, I said that I wanted you to, and, I, and, and I, did, did that hurt your feelings? I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. Now, I have been around people like that. Y'all been around anybody like that? They're just over the top. You're like, calm down. Always thinking you're hurting somebody's feelings. Now, I don't want you to go to that extreme. But I do, because here's the truth. See, I have a, a, a ministry. I don't want that to sound like, oh, I got a ministry. I have a ministry. A, a lady's ministry. <laughs> but I want to be able to minister. To, I don't even like the word minister. Let's just say serve. I want to be able to serve people. And so they got to have a little bit of a respect when they hear my name. You know what I'm saying? Same to you. You have a testimony. That used in the right way can help people. It can minister, minister, <laughs> minister to them. And you want your name to be valued and you want your name to have good thoughts associated with it. So he said, better is your good name than precious ointment. Look at what he says in the next part. We have trouble understanding things like this, but hey, it's still true. Better is the day of death than the day of one's birth. Do we really believe that? Do we live like that? I've seen people just crying. At, and look, I, I hadn't lost a lot of people who were really close to me. I hadn't. But sometimes I go to funeral homes and I think, when that day comes, if that day comes, I can't act like that. 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've seen people lay on the cot, like they would lift the corpse up. And I'm thinking, dude, the Bible said we don't go <laughs> weeping and, and mourning and acting foolish like we have no hope. I mean, he says, right. I mean, you said you trusted in a Savior who would take you with Him for eternity. I mean, come on, let's, let's get ourselves together. Now, I understand mourning and I understand, but I mean, good Lord, I mean, laying in the coffin, you know what I'm saying? That's a, that's a bit much. And he said, you know what we need to realize is better is the day that somebody dies more than the day that somebody's born. The preacher at the uh, Good Friday service said, we spend more prayers trying to keep people out of heaven than we do to keep people out of hell. Yep. There's truth to that. Why don't we grab a hold of some truth that we believe as, as believers, as Christians, that it's better for somebody to die than it is for them to be born. They're entering into rest and paradise. Hey, this is stuff that you don't get every day. This is good stuff from the wisest man. Look at verse number 5 and we'll try to move on. He said, it is better, I know we have trouble with it, but it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You ever had those friends that would just tell you whatever it was you wanted to hear? Girl, you are fine. I would do the same thing. Yes, girl. Mm, yeah. No, there's nothing wrong with that. That's like a song of a fool. They'll just sit there and tell you what you want to hear. He said, it's better be, to be corrected by somebody who's wise. Now, you ever had somebody correct you? It's not easy. It really isn't. It's not easy for somebody to say, I think you're making a mess. I think you better come back from the edge and you better sit down and think and we better reason this thing out. David Platt said, if you care about me, then you see me going off into sin, you will reach out for me if you care about me. He said, you won't sit around and super spiritually say, well, I don't want to hurt his feelings. No, he said, I'm about to lose my soul. I'm about to, you know, dive off into a poor choice. If you care anything about me, come find me, correct me. And Solomon said it's better to be rebuked by a wise person than to hear the song of fools. It's hard, but it's better. All right, let's go over to uh, chapter number 9. We'll go from 9 to 11 to 12. We'll be done. Is this making sense? This is practical. This is good stuff. Chapter number 9. You know what he says right here? I love it. He said... In verse number 3, chapter 9, verse number 3, there is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, yet there is one event unto all. We think he's talking about one event that comes to everybody. He's talking about death. And he said in verse number 8, he said, Let your garments be always white, and let your head lack no ointment. You know what he's doing here? He's talking about the things that do matter. He spent a lot of time talking about the emptiness of things that are found under the sun. But in chapter number 9, he begins to, to turn and talk on a different topic here. He says, you know what? Everything under the sun will make you feel empty, but there is one thing that happens to everybody, and it's death. And look at verse number 8. He said, let your garments be always white. You know what white is a symbol of in the Bible? It's about being clean. He talks about being pure before God. You want to know the one thing that will make you feel complete. It's not under the sun. It's beyond the sun, S-U-N. And it's found in the sun, S-O-N. And it's having your garments white, being in a right relationship, in a clean, pure relationship with God the Father. You know, I think about, as I was reading this, I thought about, I remember when I bought a Volkswagen Beetle. This is what happened. In my stocking when I was about six years old, I got a purple matchbox car, probably Hot Wheels, of a purple Volkswagen Beetle. My daddy put it in my stocking. And that's what started it. From that day, from when I pulled that thing out of that stocking, I saw that Volkswagen Beetle and my heart fell in love. And I said, I will have one of these right here. I love them. And from then on began an obsession. Man, I loved old Volkswagen Beetles. And me and my daddy would sit there and we'd talk about, he'd say, now what color are we going to paint it, Jim Jim? And I, my, my mind would change on the color I wanted. It started out candy apple red and it was going to be purple with two orange stripes that went over the back. And, and we would talk about how, and dad saying, you want, you want clear coat about an inch thick on that thing where it'll shine so much. This is some conversations my dad would have. And I'd say, yeah, it's going to be shiny. <laughs> And people bought me Volkswagens for, my, for, for occasions, you know. I'd get little snap-together models, and they were all over my room, all those Volkswagen Beetles. Well, it was probably five years ago. I, mean, I was going here. It was probably five years ago. The one came up. Orange, shiny, 
top off restore. They had taken it down to the frame, done everything. Brand new engine in it. Beautiful paint job. Orange is my favorite color. Shiny, 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 brightest orange. And I knew the guy who'd done the restore, Tim McKelvey, done the restore. I said, here it is. I'm 25 years old and my life's about to be complete. I've wanted this thing since I was six years old. I mean, almost 20 years now. I thought I've wanted this thing and here it comes. And I got along and I bought that car. I had to learn how to drive a stick. I bought a stick not knowing how to drive a stick. My daddy drove it home for me. <laughs> and so I learned how to drive the stick. I had the car and my heart was full for about two weeks. <laughs> for about two weeks. And ask me now, where's the car? I sold it. I don't even have it anymore. And you know, I got the car, and I'm telling you, for a, literally about two weeks, I thought, this is it. And I would, I'd open my door, and I'd just look at that car, and I'd just smile like, man, there it is. I mean, I'd probably kiss it a few times, you know? I mean, there's the car I'd wanted my whole life. And then I began to realize, these things are really impractical. They don't have air conditioning. It's hot as blazes in this car, you know? You roll down your windows going to work or church or anywhere else, and you get there and you have this like this, you know? But I, I got the, you must be driving the bug. Yeah, how'd you know? You know? They don't have air. They, um, the gas tank's in the front and the engine's in the back, so you constantly smell gas inside the cab. If you got a headache and you get in that car, it's just going to be amplified. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I ran out of gas in that car probably four times. I've never run out of gas in my life, but the, the gas hand was not accurate. I mean, it worked, but it wasn't accurate. And I thought, why did I want this thing? And I'm really over this thing. And the next thing I know, I was writing 706-584-1259 on a for sale sign and stuck in the back of the car. And it's gone now. But honest to goodness, when I was 25 years old, that's when I really finally learned this lesson. There is nothing. If that Volkswagen Beetle didn't make me happy, there's nothing in this world that can make me happy. Do you know what people who are not married think will make them happy? Being married. Finding that one person. I mean, Tiffany doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I'm just kidding. But you know what? They're always th that's what it's going to be. Do you know what people who don't have children think it's going to take to make them happy? Just having those children. Megan, does it work that way? And Solomon said, look, let's just realize nothing will ever give you that feeling. I learned that when I was 25 years old. But let me tell you something. September will be 20 years since the Lord saved me. 20 years. My heart is still full over that moment right there. When I think that the God of the universe pursued me, I don't mean to be cliche and over-spiritual, but we sang that song, I have found the way. I did not find the way. I was absolutely minding my own business. My way was the way to hell. I was not looking for the way. The way found me. I mean, honest to goodness. And he pursued a relationship with me. And to this day, think about this right here. There's nothing you could ever do to make him love you any less. Nothing. There might be people in your life, there might be friends in your life, that if you did certain things, fill in the blank, they would love you less. I mean, that's just the truth about people. I know that there are those, those lines probably with everybody. If I were to do certain things, there's probably a lot of you who would think, woo, you just came down a notch. So be it. That's fine. That's people. But there's nothing that I could ever do to make God love me any less. Think on that for a second. Nothing I could ever do to make Him love me any less. Think on this one. There's nothing I could ever do to make Him love me any more. He loves me with a perfect, complete love right now and pursues me every day. Every day when I wake up, He wants to hear from me. My heart is still filled with that. My heart is still full thinking about that. That's been 20 years. No car will do that. No person will do that. No child will ever do that. In fact, turn over to where he says, because I think y'all think this is crazy and it's not really true. Turn to chapter number 6, verse number 3. You know what he said right here? If a man begot a hundred children and lived many years so that the days of his years were many, but his soul was not filled with good. You know how your soul is filled with good, right? When it's filled with Jesus. He said, then a, an untimely birth will be better than him. He said, have a hundred of them. They're never going to give you that satisfied feeling. Now, do your children make you happy? Sure, they, they do give you that feeling momentarily. But it doesn't fulfill your heart like a relationship with God will. Look at what he says in verse number 6 of chapter number 6. Though a man live a thousand years twice told, 
See, every one of us has got something in our head we think, well, if I could just live longer. Well, if I just had more children. Well, if I just met this person. Well, let me tell you what I've learned through dating. There's a whole lot worse things than being single. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You get around some annoying son of a gun, good Lord above. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? I take being single any day <laughs> over certain things. You know what I'm saying? But there's something in your head, and if you're honest, you can think of it. You know what it is. I know what I thought it was for so long. There's something in your head you think, yeah, but if I just, oh, I know she says that, I know, but if I ever just had the, listen, the book has been written on it. Nothing except what he says in chapter number nine, verse number eight, let your garments be white before the Lord. Walk in a right relationship with, with him. Now look at, real quick uh, at the end here. Let's just turn over to chapter number 12. Chapter number 12. This is what he said. In chapter number 12, he said in verse number 7, he said, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. The Spirit shall return to the God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. It all is empty, he said. And he said, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. He gave good heed. He said in order many proverbs. He said, the preacher, he's kind of talking about himself in another term, uh, another uh, tense here. He said, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, that which was written. He said, the words of the wise are like this. Look at verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Talking about this whole book he's just written. Empty, how everything's empty. Under the sun, everything's empty. Look at what he says in verse number 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Is God under the sun? He's beyond the sun. He said, keep His commandments. For this is the full duty of man. Verse number 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The summation of all this is this right here. Nothing under the sun. Nothing. Not your children. Not your spouse. Not your family. Not possessions. Not experiences. Not going here or going there. Will ever give you that satisfied, full feeling that your heart longs for. Somebody said there's a God-shaped hole inside the heart of, only, of every man. Only God can fill that hole. There is so much truth to that. I think it's sobering to look at this, this book right here. Written 3,000 years ago. Americans are the most frivolous, money-spending people I think I've ever laid my eyes on. And I can't help but think we're all just thinking that it's all going to give us some kind of feeling at some point or another, isn't it? I mean, that's what our hearts are going for. But here's my advice to you this morning. Learn from Solomon when he said, I tried it all. I got everything. And it all made me feel empty. Chapter number 12, verse number 1. Let me read this real quick. He said, Remember now thy Creator in the days of your youth. You know, right now you're as youthful as you'll ever be. You realize that, right? Some of you might be sitting here saying, man, I'm 40 years old and I still hadn't really I still hadn't really got a hold of that. Well, 40 right now is the youngest you'll ever be. Chapter number 12, verse 1 said, Remember now, your Creator, while you're in the days of your youth. Hey, there's no better time than now to fix this. No better time than now to get your priorities in order. 